The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the book of the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 1, reading verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6 in the first chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Now let us be clear about the connection here. Let me start reading at verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation! A people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Well, we are continuing, in other words, our study of this introduction to the prophecy of the, this great evangelical prophet Isaiah. We've seen that in these first verses he summarizes his great message, and that's why we are looking at it and examining it together. He is addressing his fellow countrymen who are in trouble, and he can see worse things coming. And he was sent by God to them to address them, to call them to stop and to ponder and to consider. They're in trouble because they don't consider, because they don't know. But God sends his prophet and other prophets after him and like him, in order to cause them to ponder and to consider their ways, that they may repent and return unto God ere it is too late. That's the whole purpose of his message, as it is the purpose of the message of every other prophet whose writings we have here in the Old Testament. But as I'm trying to show, it's the message of the whole Bible. That's what the Bible is about. The Bible is a word addressed by God to the world, the world which he himself has made, to men whom he himself has made. The children of Israel are but a specimen. And what is said to them can be said in a wider measure and circled to the whole world of men. Now, then, what is the prophet's message? Well, essentially, it's a very simple one. He really has got two big things to say to them. And the first is that they must realize the cause of their troubles. Now, he starts with that because it's common sense, isn't it, to know that uh, you should make a diagnosis before you begin to treat. You don't rush to do something before you know what's the matter. Some people do, I know, but it's a very foolish thing to do. The essence of wisdom is to discover what's wrong and then to apply the appropriate remedy. And that's precisely what he does, what the whole Bible does. But uh, it's very important that we should realize this and that we should take these things in the right order. Now, mankind doesn't like that, of course. Any foolish patient doesn't like that. We want ease. We want deliverance. We want happiness. And we can't be bothered with diagnosis. It takes time and investigations. We want something to stop the pain. But it can be a very bad and even a criminal thing to stop the pain before you know what is causing the pain. You can be masking and hiding something that is of very serious importance. So, you see, the prophet here does what the whole Bible does. It 
insist upon our coming face to face with the cause of our ills. And then and only then and afterwards does it tell us about the remedy that it has to give us and to offer us uh, which alone can deal with and can cure those ills. Now here then I say is the message of God as I see it to the whole world at this present time. A world in trouble. A world in confusion. A world in pain. A world which, if we believe some of the greatest modern scientists, a world which may very well be living during the last ten years of its existence. Now, I'm not saying that. Over half the great world scientists who met in that conference called Pugwash recently solemnly have asserted that. They doubt very much whether the world has another ten years to go. I think they're wrong, but it doesn't matter about that. That's what they say, and it may well be true. In any case, we all are aware of the fact that we are in an age of terrible crisis, a world of trouble and a world of pain and of confusion. And therefore, I'm reminding you that the first thing we have to do is to realize the cause of our troubles. Now, it is this book alone that insists upon that, but it absolutely insists upon it. It's got the remedy here. This is, in this book there is what is called a gospel, good news, a way of deliverance, a way of salvation. It's been preached for nearly 2,000 years. Well, why doesn't everybody believe it? Why doesn't everybody tonight turn immediately and accept this message, believe the gospel? Why not? If they did, all our problems would be solved. They'd smash all their bombs, there'd be no need of armies, there'd be no troubles. If everybody in the world tonight was a Christian, There'd be no threat of war. There'd be none of the disruption that we are seeing in society. None at all. The world would be paradise again. But why don't they believe it? Why is it that the modern man, like all who have gone before him, is rejecting this gospel in the mass and in the main? I'm suggesting that there's only one answer to that question. He still has to realize the cause of his trouble. He thinks he knows the cause, but he doesn't. And it's because he's wrong in the cause that all his remedies are utterly useless and are all failing round and about us. We must of necessity start with the cause of our ills. We must have a diagnosis. So, I'm not saying this by way of apology, but I am saying it by way of exposition. I'm going to hold you once more face to face with what Isaiah tells us about sin. We've already done it for three Sunday evenings. We're still doing it. I've got to follow him. I'm not here to give vent and expression to my ideas and theories. I'm here to expound the word of God. And as Isaiah goes on diagnosing still and probing and revealing the depths of sin, I've got to follow him. Now, this is something I say that is necessary for everybody in this congregation. This isn't only a service for those who don't believe the gospel. I've got quite as much to say tonight to those who do believe it. And I am suggesting that those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and members of the Christian church need quite as much to be brought to a realization of the depth of sin as does the unbeliever. What do you mean, says somebody? Well, what I mean is this. Why are God's people so silent and often so complacent at a time like this? Why is it that all God's people are not pleading with God to send revival in the church? Why is it that we are not all pleading with God to open the windows of heaven and to pour forth his Holy Spirit and to do a work in our midst that will shake the nations? Why not? Because I'm afraid it's true to say that the majority of Christian people are not praying like that. Why not? Well, there's only one answer. They have never realized the depth of the problem. You see, there's a very real danger for Christian people because they're good people. And because they're living a good life, there is a great danger that they may know nothing about what's happening in the world round and about them. Because they don't do certain things, because they don't look at certain things, they're not aware that they're happening. But my friends, we are living in a society that is disintegrating round and about us. 
We are living in a time of moral collapse. And it is advancing with a terrible rapidity. Are we aware of that? Do we realize that nothing but a mighty outpouring of God's Spirit is adequate to deal with it? I'm afraid the tendency is that we go on with our nice services, Sunday by Sunday, having happy fellowship, occasional special effort perhaps, and we feel everything's all right. You'd imagine from the religious journals that everything's all right. They say very little about revival. Everything seems to be going well. But here is society, I say, collapsing before our eyes with the terrible moral muddle and degradation. We've got to realize the truth about it. We've got to realize, I say, that the problem is such that nothing but an intervention of God himself can possibly retrieve the situation. Nothing short of that's going to touch it. We've tried everything else. We've been busy. We've organized. But the position is deteriorating. And not only in this country, but in every other country. The problem is appalling. Are God's people aware of this? If they're not, it is because they've never realized the truth concerning the depth of sin. Such as Isaiah expounds it before our eyes in these verses. Very well. I say that to Christian people in this congregation as we pass along. But I say it still more to those who are not Christians. I say it still more to those who reject the gospel of Christ and think they're clever in doing so. I say it still more to those who scoff at the Bible and feel it's out of date and something that has become quite outmoded. Why do I say so? Well, I say it for this reason. That I know that all thinking people amongst them, and there are many thinking people who are not Christians, They're aware of the fact that there's something wrong. They're concerned about the situation. They write about it and they talk about it and they discuss it together. But according to this message, they're so hopelessly wrong as to the cause of the troubles that not only will they not believe the gospel, everything they are doing and will do will come to nothing. Now then, what's the matter? Well, I'm suggesting that the whole trouble is this failure to understand what the Bible means when it talks about sin. Did you notice the Apostle Paul in that seventh chapter of the epistle to the Romans? This is the thing, he says, that's ruining my life, ruining everything. This sin that is within me. And the Bible case is that it's in all men. And this is the essence of our problem. But the world doesn't believe that. What does it believe? Well, the world, recognizing that there is something wrong and that there is a problem, is of opinion that uh, what is really necessary to put it right is something like this. First of all, teaching, knowledge, education. It believes still that all our troubles are due to our ignorance. And that all the trouble in the story of the human race up to date has been entirely due to this fact that man was so ignorant. And that he wants what he needs is enlightenment, knowledge, understanding. So we thank God for science, as it were. And all this which is going to help us to see and to know. If only people could be trained to think, they say, and face the facts, then there'd be no trouble at all. The problem can be solved by rationalism. Rationalism. You're familiar with the leaders of that movement. I needn't mention their names. They're not Christians. They tell us that they're not. And they write books to say why they're not Christians. Rationalists. All that's needed is knowledge, application of reason and logic, common sense, whole problem solved. And of course, sometimes they're ready to include in this teaching and this knowledge that we need the teaching of Jesus, as they call him. They're prepared to quote the Sermon on the Mount about turning the other cheek and so on. They say how obviously right and true it is. And so they'll even bring this in. All that's necessary is teaching. That's the commonest view of all. But there's another one, very similar. Uh, To others, the problem is a a kind of a matter of sickness. You see, nearly all these problems that are troubling life today are nothing but some sort of psychological sickness. So that uh, when men, you see, are arraigned before a court and tried for some misdemeanor or some crime, 
They say you mustn't call it crime. You mustn't call it sin. That's an illness. That's a sickness. So if you put people in prison, you don't make them work. You give them psychological treatment. You speak kindly and nicely to them. They're sick people. There's no such thing as crime. There's no such thing as sin. It's all sickness. So you multiply your psychiatrists and you give them this psychological treatment. And if you only do that and go on and explain things to them and give them a new outlook and a new teaching and uh, mix them up with nice and kind people, gradually you'll cure the sickness and the problems of society and of morality will be solved. Large numbers take that view. Indeed, there are others who really say that we needn't be too excited about the thing at all, that the world is advancing, man is improving, and it's purely a question of time. Man will come to his own. He'll obviously see the folly and he'll slough off all these things that have held him back, and in the upward reach of the whole of the human race, he'll arrive at a kind of perfection. Be patient, they say. This can't be done in a day. Rome wasn't built in a day. And the human race isn't going to be put right in a day. Have patience, they say. And then there's another, and it's to this, of course, my text makes me refer particularly tonight. Another matter I must put before you, and that's this whole question of punishment. Now, one of the greatest changes that has taken place in this century is man's view of punishment. He used to say that the main function of punishment was uh, to punish. It was punitive. But nowadays that's very unpopular. We are told that the main business of punishment is to reform. It's to be a remedial. And we must get rid, we are told, of that old legalistic notion about punishment. And therefore the whole attitude, as I've said already, to prisoners in prisons and so on has been changed. Prisons have become reformatories. And here we are to heal people and to teach them and to introduce them into the new life. Now, you see, what it's all based upon is this. That man is essentially good. At any rate, he's not essentially bad. What man needs is help. Light, knowledge, education, instruction, psychiatric treatment, any one of these things. And then... He will be delivered. Man, they say, is essentially all right. Boss, they say, the Bible talks about sin. And the old preachers used to talk about sin. But we've outgrown all that. We know that all that's nonsense. And therefore they believe these other things and they put their faith in them. But, and here's the question. All that has been tried now for a long time. And the time has arrived when we must ask the obvious question, what has it led to? What of the results? The Bible has been thrown overboard for nearly a hundred years. It all began more or less round about 1860 with Charles Darwin and his book on the origin of species and so on, and it's gone on ever since. And in this present century, and especially since 1914, the Bible has really gone, and the church has really gone, and men can get on without it and without God. But the question, I say, does arise, doesn't it? Uh, what of the situation? Why is the world then as it is? What's the matter? Why do people reject this and believe these other things? There's only one answer. And that is that they've never realized the depth of the problem. In other words, they've never realized the truth of the biblical teaching concerning sin. The message of God through this book to the world tonight is this, is that its problem is so deep, it's so profound, that nothing and no one but the almighty God himself can deal with it. That it's beyond men. It's the whole message of the Bible. Why did the Son of God ever come into the world? There's only one answer. The problem of men in sin was so terrible and so profound that nothing but such an intervention could possibly deal with it. The law had been given. It didn't save. Nothing can save. The law, in that it was weak through the flesh, couldn't save. So God sends his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Now then, let me put this before you. The trouble, I say, is that man doesn't realize the depth of the problem. He doesn't realize the true nature of sin. 
That's precisely what Isaiah was saying to his contemporaries nearly 10,000 years ago. He was 10, wait a minute, 800 years before the birth of Christ. Nearly 2,800 years ago. Nearly 3,000 years ago. Here he is writing uh, to his nation in trouble and that is what he tells them. He says, you've got to realize this terrible thing called sin. That's your trouble. You won't listen to anything else. You won't listen to God's appeal when he says, come, let us reason together until you realize that you're in a hopeless plight and that nothing but God himself can possibly put you right. So, you see, he starts off his book with an analysis of sin. Now, we've looked at it, as I say, three Sunday nights. We've been looking at the essential character of sin. Sin is rebellion against God. Uh, Sin as men leaving his father and leaving his home and going to the far country and there squandering his goods, not realizing what he's doing. Man a fool, man a pervert. The ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doesn't know. My people uh, doth not consider. And then last Sunday night we were looking at it as he defined sin in terms of sin itself and iniquity and evil and corruption. And we ended on this note. That man in this foolish, mad, perverted state provokes the Holy One of Israel to anger and doesn't realize that he's doing it. Very well, there's the nature of sin. Now then, here's a new paragraph. In your your Bibles, you'll find that verse 5 starts a new paragraph. Why? Well, it's quite right. Here the prophet turns to the consequences of sin. And, of course, man in sin is equally ignorant of the consequences of sin as he is of the nature of sin, or the character of sin. Man in sin, I say, is not aware of what he's bringing upon himself. He's blind to it. So the prophet addresses him in these words. Why should you be stricken any more? He says, look at yourself. Here you are, he says, you've been smitten so much that your whole body is covered with bruises and wounds and putrefying sores. You're a mass of festering bruises. And still you go on sinning. Do you want more? Now that's how he puts it. Here he is, in other words, introducing us directly and immediately to the whole question of the consequences of sin. And I'm calling attention to the subject for this reason. As we look at the consequences of sin, we see still more and still further into the character of sin. My dear friends, this is my message. This world as it is tonight, because it doesn't realize the terrible power of sin. This is the first thing we need to be enlightened of. Let's follow him then as he shows us this in unfolding to us something of the consequences of sin, the depth of sin, this terrible power. What does it do? Well, one thing he tells us is this, that it affects the whole of life. Now, we must start with that. Sin is something that affects the whole of life. Here, you see, is the entire biblical case. I'm going to go on repeating this as long as I have breath. God made a perfect world, and he made a perfect man in it. Why is the world as it is tonight? Why are we as we are? Why all the trouble and the pain and the agony and the heartache? There's only one answer, sin. Sin is the cause of the ruination. The Bible is a great exposure of sin in its depths and in its ugliness. It's something, I say, that affects the whole of life. Listen. He puts it like this. The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it but wounds, etc. Now, that can be interpreted in two ways. I've already interpreted it in one way that the whole body is like that because God has been beating this sinful creature. He's been punishing him until he's black and blue and he's festering with sores. But it also can be taken in another way, and I believe both of them are true. It can be, and is a very perfect description of sin itself. What is this thing called sin? What is this thing that is damning the whole life of man and ruining everything in this world? 
What is it that explains the whole course of human history? Why is it that in this 20th century we are in this appalling muddle and mess that we are in with a threat even of the end because of man's madness with his atomic bombs? What's the explanation of it all? Well, what is this thing called sin? Well, according to the Bible, you see, it isn't just some slight defect. It isn't just some negative phase in man's evolutionary progress. That's what the non-Christian believes. He says, oh, you mustn't say that sin is positive. You mustn't say man's bad. What you really mean is that he's not as good as he ought to be. Now, that's the whole question. It's one or the other of those two. What is the trouble in the world tonight? Is man just not as good as he might be and as he should be and as he can be? Or is he positively evil and sinful? Now then, the whole point here is that he's positively evil and sinful in this sense, that he is being governed and controlled and mastered by this terrible power which the Bible calls sin. And here I say the first point he makes is this, that it's something that is true of everybody. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. Now, the learned commentators are here agreed in saying that that is a pictorial way of saying that from the lowest in the land to the highest in the land, they're all guilty. They're all in the same boat. They're all suffering from the same thing. And that, of course, is something that the Bible says from beginning to end about humanity and about human nature. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The whole world lieth guilty before God. Everybody. Oh, this is important. You see, there are some nice, polite, respectable people who say sin. You don't talk about sin in the west end of London. That applies to the east end of London. Sin, that doesn't apply to polite society and to cultured, sophisticated people. It's all right amongst backward peoples and people who live in slums and in hovels and things like that. No, no, they say. No, says the Bible. It's true of all classes. The Bible's not interested in social distinctions and classes. Your upper ten are as sinful as your lowest ten, if there's such a thing. There's no difference. None at all. We divide ourselves up into social classes. The Bible isn't interested. Everybody's a sinner. Whatever his birth, whatever his ancestry, whatever his social position, it doesn't make the slightest difference. All of sin. But it's equally true about all types. The clever people say, of course, ah, oh, yes, you people, you are chapel-going people. You, of course, have got the religious complex. And we're divided up into psychological types and groups. Of course, if you've got that kink, the religious kink, you'll be a religious person. If you haven't got it, you won't be. It's all right. doesn't matter. Why should everybody have the same kink? So the whole thing is dismissed in terms of psychological divisions and of types. Now, says the Bible, everybody, whatever the type. Well, of course, what if you were to make an analysis of this congregation tonight? What a variety of types we should have here. Some mercurial. Some lethargic, flabby, phlegmatic. Some uh, interested in art, some in music, some in mathematics, and so on and so forth. But you see here, it doesn't matter at all. Every one of them, from the toe to the head, everybody, every psychological type. There's not a man, I don't care what his interest is, I don't care what his temperament is. There is not a man, there is not a woman alive or has ever lived, but that is a sinner and is a failure in some moral respect, every one. And is equally true about gifts. Some people are very fond of dividing up humanity according to brain power. The able people, the gifted people, the thinkers, the great brains, and the other people who haven't got any brains. Oh, they say, of course, the people who have got no brains, they're religious, but we, we've got brains, we think. No, no, says the Bible, you're all sinners. 
And of course I could prove this thing quite easily. You are great philosophers are saying exactly the same thing about religion as the biggest fool standing on a street corner with a cigarette in his mouth. He says there's nothing in it. The only difference between the two is that the philosopher says it in very learned, pseudo-scientific language. But they're both saying the same thing. Your great philosopher with his great brain, he's guilty of adultery and it's been proved. So are Tom, Dick and Harry and it's been proved of them also. There's no difference. You see, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin and brains or lack of brains, knowledge, learning, ignorance, they make no difference at all. Some of the most learned, erudite, cultivated, cultured men in this country this evening are slaves to drink. Like some of the commonest people so-called in the land are slaves to drink and other things tonight. These horrible perversions about which we are hearing so much, are they confined to one class? Of course they're not. They're in all classes. Men of intellect as well as fools. Everybody, learning and ignorant, doesn't matter. All the world comes to this one point, from the sole of the foot to the head, all are involved. That's what the Bible says, and it says the truth, doesn't it? Our newspapers are proving the Bible every day. I never read my newspaper these days without seeing some proof of the biblical message. In high society, they're doing the same things as in the lawyers. Same thing exactly. Very well, I mustn't stop with this. None are immune. But not only is this true, you see, of all people, but it's equally true to say that the whole of each one of us is involved by sin, head and heart. Sin is not only something that applies to conduct, it applies to the whole man, the whole personality. Because we are sinners, our minds are involved, our hearts are involved, our wills are involved, our bodies are involved, our souls are involved, our spirits are involved. There's not a part of man that isn't involved by sin. It isn't merely a matter of conduct. It isn't merely a matter of the will. Sin is that which makes a man think wrongly. I've demonstrated that a few Sunday nights back. One of the first things that went wrong when man sinned was his mind. And the whole trouble in the world tonight is that man does not know how to think. He can't think properly. He can't think straightly. But his heart is equally involved. His feelings, his sensibilities, his sensations, his desires, all these things are involved and his will is involved. It's paralyzed. Every part of man, there's not a part of man that isn't involved by sin. Well, I mustn't keep you with this. Let me give you this word of the apostle again in that seventh chapter of the epistle to the Romans. It, he says it twice over. Listen to it in verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Listen to it in verse 18. I know that in me, that is to say in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. There is no part of us that's right by nature. Not a single part of us. When man fell, he fell as a whole. Every part of him fell. His body fell. Our bodies were not meant to be like this. They were meant to be absolutely perfect and beautiful. We've fallen in every respect. Body, soul, spirit. Mind, heart, will, everything in man has gone down and is twisted and perverted. It is a matter of total corruption. The head and the heart. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. Sin so affects men that there's no redeeming feature really left in him. That doesn't mean to say that every man is as bad as he possibly can be all the time and at the same time, but it does mean this, that with every one of us there is a blight upon our very best. There is something tarnished even in our noblest. The whole man is involved by sin. You see the importance of this? You see, these other people are saying all we need is knowledge and information, training of the mind, as if our hearts were all right. As if our wills were all right. Others then say that all you need is this psychological readjustment, put your heart right as it were, and your head will look after itself and your will. Will they? 
and then those who preach morality and good conduct and address the will only. They seem to think the mind's all right and the heart is all right. But you see, it's their ignorance that makes them think that. The Apostle Paul had discovered it all for himself. He says, no, no, I'm a mass of contradictions. The evil that I would not, that I do, and the good that I would, I do not. I'm divided in myself. My mind's right. My something else in my members dragging me down. And when I put that right, this has gone wrong. Here I am. Where am I? What can I do? Oh, wretched men, who shall deliver me? Oh, men, it's a hopeless business. Well, now, there is the first point that is made by the prophet here this evening. That sin is this terrible power that has affected the whole of man's life in every respect and in every department of his existence. But unless he doesn't stop at that, he goes on. The next thing he says is this. That sin is a terrible power that prevents us from learning, even from punishment and suffering. Why should he be stricken any more? Why are you asking for more, he says? You've been slashed, you've been beaten, you've been chastised with whips and scorpions. And you look as if you're asking for more. Well, I interpret that in this principle, that man in sin is in the power of this terrible thing uh, which prevents his learning even from punishment and suffering. Here is Israel, says Isaiah, staggering under the blows and still going on with it. Now, this is something I say again that this modern generation needs to learn. Man in sin does not listen to the teaching and the instruction which God gives him through his word and above all through the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us this book. God sent prophets in the past. He sent his own son into the world. He sent apostles and he's raised preachers. What for? Well, to offer the gospel. To tell men and women to believe that here is the way of life and the way of salvation. He offers them the gospel. They won't accept it. They reject it with contumely and scorn. But you see, there's something even worse than that. As the result of their rejection of God's word and God's way of life and God's commandments and God's gospel, God punishes them. That's a great principle taught in the Bible from the very beginning to the very end that the way of the transgressor is hard. God, having made man perfect and having put him into paradise, when he sinned, God punished him. He told him he would, and he did it. Whenever a man sins, he always gets punishment. He doesn't always know it, but he does. There is always punishment for sin. God has said that he's going to do it, and he is doing it, and he will do it in a still bigger scale, as we saw last Sunday night. Punishment of sin, what? Well, remorse. Remorse is one of God's ways of punishing sin. We've all known it, haven't we? Remorse, mental agony, soul trouble, shame, actual suffering perhaps in your body as a result of some sin you've committed. It's invariable. It always happens. Sin always carries a certain amount of punishment with it. Put your finger into the fire, you'll burn your finger. Sin against God's holy commandments and you will pay for it in some shape or form. It is impossible to sin and not bear some suffering. And God had been punishing these children of Israel, but on they went with their sin. They won't learn from punishment. Why will he be stricken any more? What's the matter with you? I've smitten you in order to correct you and to pull you up, but you're going on, you're taking no notice. And this, I say, is something that is true of the whole of the human race and of every individual. This is a fact, my friends, that sin is such a terrible power in the life of men that it prevents his even learning from punishment, from suffering. It 
take the familiar phrase, there's the men who were sinning last night, if you like, in the matter of drink. And he woke up this morning with that feeling that is described as the morning after the night before. Feeling ill, with a violent headache, aching all over, a sense of shame and a sense of debauchery. Feeling unworthy and unclean, and literally suffering in a physical sense. But does that stop him? Of course it doesn't. He goes on. You'd have thought that that would be enough, that once he'd had that awful feeling of this morning after the night before, he'd never do it again. But he goes on doing it. Well, that's only an illustration. It is true in some shape or form of every sin. And yet man goes on sinning. But I want to emphasize this also. It is equally true of mankind as a whole and mankind at large. I can easily prove this. Look at this 20th century of ours. Look at the suffering. Look at the trouble. Look at the pain. Look at the agony. Look at the millions that have been killed. Look at the bereavement. Look at the sorrow. Look at the ruined, spoiled lives. Look at it all. We've had it twice over in one century. Has mankind learned the lesson? Look at your newspapers. You've got an iron curtain. They're still preparing for war. They're doing exactly what they've done twice before. They're preparing for it. They're leading up to something. Though they've suffered, war is madness. Nobody can pretend it's anything else. It is sheer lunacy. And we've suffered and suffered and suffered. We can read our history books. We can see that war always brings suffering. It always brings poverty. It always brings starvation. It always brings maimed bodies. Oh, it's a terrible thing. And there are our history books, and we've been through it ourselves. Have we learned the lesson? I quote again that thing I'm so fond of quoting from Hegel. History teaches us that history teaches us nothing. Though we suffer, though we have the pain, though we are punished of God, we still go on. Some people thought that that last war we had was going to reform Great Britain. They say, surely, when we've had to go through a thing like this the second time, the nation will be pulled up. It'll see the folly of the way it's been living and all the dissolution of all those thirties. Men will be all right again and there'll be a new life lived. There'll be a better land and a better way of living. What utter rubbish. Man in the grip of sin never reforms as a result of punishment and suffering. That's where he shows that he's a pervert. That's where he shows he's a fool. Why doesn't he? Well, I can tell you why quite easily. The power of sin is so great that it dulls a man's memory. Man, immediately after he's sinned, is filled with shame and he's suffering and he says, I'll never do it again. I can't possibly go through this again. It's inconceivable. But by the next morning, it doesn't seem quite so bad. The next morning, it's still less bad. In a week's time, there's nothing wrong at all in it. The sin, you see, can dull the memory. It can blunt the edges of the memory. It can paralyze the memory. Not only that, it can twist facts. It can take them and manipulate them and prove anything it likes. It can manipulate our own reason and vitiate all our argumentation. It'll inflame our desires, it'll paint beautiful pictures, it'll put on rose spectacle color, colors of spectacles, it'll paralyze the will. And so when the temptation comes again, we forgot all about what we felt and we do the same thing once more. My friends, there's no need to keep you over this, there's no need to argue about this. If you don't agree with what I'm saying here in my exposition of the biblical teaching concerning the power and the depth of sin, I simply ask you this one question. Why do you keep on doing that thing that gets you down? Why do you go on doing a thing that you're ashamed of? Why do you say, I'll never do it again and then do it again? Why are you down all this? Why are you in this conflict that the apostle speaks of? There's only one answer. It is the power of sin. And it's greater than your power. It's greater than my power. It's the greatest power in the world apart from one. And that is the power of God. 
So you see, it's such a tyrannical power that it even prevents a man from learning from suffering, learning from punishment. Why will he be stricken any more? What's the matter with you, says the prophet? And it needs to be said to this present generation. But let me come to my last principle, which is this. Sin is such a terrible power that it makes us so incorrigible that suffering and teaching not only do not correct us and deliver us, they even aggravate our sin and make us sin all the more. Why should he be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. I'm slashing you, says God, but it makes you revolt all the more. What's the matter with you? There's only one answer, it is sin. Now, here is the depth of sin. Here we see the exceeding sinfulness of sin, as the Apostle Paul puts it. That punishment and uh, retribution and correction not only do not deliver me and make me rise out of it, it drives me more deeply into it. He will revolt more and more. Now, again, the facts speak for themselves. I needn't press them. This can be seen in the individual, can't it? There's nothing more tragic in the whole of life than to see a poor fellow going down and down and down into the depths of sin. He suffers himself. He brings suffering upon his loved ones and dear ones. Not only does it not deliver him, it seems to drive him to desperation. He does it more and more. Every appeal makes him worse. Every correction makes him worse. Down and down and down he goes. He seems to be inflamed by everything that tries to deliver him. Isn't it true? And isn't it true of the entire human race? The Bible's got great illustrations of this. Take that period just before the flood. There was a man called Noah, a righteous man, building an ark and preaching his message of judgment and of righteousness. Do you know the effect he had upon them? He made them sin all the more. The more he preached, the worse they got. And it all became inflamed until every imagination of the thought of men was only entirely and altogether evil. Same in Sodom and Gomorrah. The righteous lot was there. It made no difference. It made them worse. You will find that in the Bible, in its very history, that before every great judgment, the people seem to be becoming desperately worse and worse. It happened before the captivity of Babylon. It's always happened. And my dear friends, it's happening today. Though I say we've had these two world wars, which I regard as the chastisements of God. I regard them as the stripes of God. I regard them as God slashing us. And here we are bruised and covered with festering sores and we're faint and weak. But what effect is it having? It's driving men into still greater arrogance in his sin. Week by week and day by day you see it in your newspapers. The increasing threat of calamity and the increasing foulness, openness, arrogance of sin. I say again that you would have thought that the two world wars and all the other troubles would have sobered the human race. It's having the exact opposite effect, isn't it? It's sinning more and more. It's revolting more and more. Man is becoming more arrogant in his sin every, every day. He's flouting God. He's ridiculing him. He's laughing at him. He's turning everything upside down. He says, evil be thou my good. He's preaching it. He's enjoying it. He's gloating in it. He's advertising it. He's exposing it himself. And gone he goes worse and worse. More and more blatant. Instead, I say, of being corrected by punishment and suffering, man in sin becomes worse and worse. He madly he obstinately, in his incorrigibility, defies the living God. He rejects all his appeals. He spurns all his instruction. He laughs at all God's punishment. He says, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. 
It's a short life. Let it be a merry one then. If we're all going to be blasted to nothing, well, let's get our fill of it before we are blasted. Isn't that the argument? Isn't that at the back of all this open evil, this arrogant, violent, blasphemous sin that's staring this country in the face? What's the matter with men? Ah, I'm telling you there's only one explanation. This conduct is utterly irrational. You can train a beast to behave itself. You can train a dog. You can train him, give him house manners, whatever they call them. You can train animals, but you can't train men. Man's a fool. Unlike the ox, unlike the ass, unlike the heavens, unlike the earth. He's a fool. What's good for him, he twists and perverts into evil. And all God's instruction makes men sin more. Did you notice the apostle putting that once and forever? He tells us that this was his own experience. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. What he mean? Listen to him. He says, is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but the law, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the Lord said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. The commandment which is ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear, sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. All that just means this. You know, says Paul, I by nature as a man in sin was as vile as this that even God's holy law, which was given by God to guide me and to correct me and to teach me and to instruct me in the way of righteousness and of holiness, it actually drove me into sin. By telling me not to do a thing, it inflamed my desire to do it. The motions of sin, which were aggravated by the law, did work in my members to bring forth fruit unto death. So when you give your children morality teaching, you're encouraging them to sin. Everything's twisted. Man's nature is so sinful that even good, clean instruction will do him harm. He'll twist it. He'll feed upon it. He'll gloat upon it. It'll be bad for him. Even God's law is twisted by sin that it kills me, slays me, and makes me worse than I was before. And it's all due to the power of sin. Very well. Is there any hope for men? Well, you see, don't you? There's no need to argue with you. If what I've been saying is true, there's only one hope for men. It's not in men. The power of sin is greater than the power of men. We're all living witnesses of that, and the whole world is proving it. There's only one hope. What is it? It's not in men. Not any teaching, not any psychotherapy, not any advance, nothing. There's only one hope. The power of God. And that is the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, says Paul to the Romans, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. What man needs is not knowledge, it's not instruction, it's not information, it's not medical treatment, it's not psychotherapy, it's none of these things. What he needs is a new heart. A new nature. A nature that will hate the darkness and love the light instead of loving the darkness and hating the light. He needs an entire renovation. And blessed be the name of God. It is the very thing that God offers us in and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Son of God came and took unto him human nature and united it to himself. Why? Well, that he might give that nature to you and to me. He came into the world. Why? Well, because the power of of sin and of the devil was greater than the power of all mankind. 
He came because he alone has the power, and he has it. He's defeated the devil. And he can deliver any of you who believe in him from the power of the devil, and from the power of sin, and from the power of evil. The Son of God came into this world in order that we might be delivered from sin in every respect, from its guilt. He died on the cross to deal with the guilt. From its power, he rose again and sent the Spirit and will come and dwell in us that we may say to the devil, flee from me. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He came to make us more than conquerors. He puts his own divine nature into us. This new nature, this new life, nothing else will suffice. Teaching can't help me. Punishment even doesn't help me. Makes me worse. I need to be a new man. And I'll then love God and love his word, love his commandments, love his teaching, and have his power within me day by day to lead me and to guide me and to direct me. Now, my friends, The moment you see the truth about the nature and the power of sin, there's no difficulty about believing the gospel. It's the only hope. It's the only thing that can deliver. Why not believe in it? Why not confess your sins? Why not acknowledge your failure, your utter failure to God? And cry out unto him to deliver you. And he will answer you. He'll tell you that he's already sent his son and that the work is complete. That you can be delivered in a second. And translated from the kingdom of Satan and of darkness. Into the kingdom of God's dear son. It is only the power of God that can deliver from the power of sin and evil. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.